Thank you very much. I hope you welcome you. You better ask us. It's, uh, it's quite a trip, actually, to be up here again after a year and a half or two years. I feel like I haven't done many in-person things for a long time, and this is me sort of coming out of my little home Zoom office, where I think many of us have been uh, sort of confined for a long time, and then sort of getting used to being in front of the live audience again. So good morning. Thank you for joining me here today. Um, wow, thank you, Jay, for such a lovely, uh, such a lovely introduction. So we're going to be talking today about being in the flow. This is the theme of the month, this September, being in the flow. And of course, as a clinical psychologist, when I heard we're going to talk about being in the flow, I of course need to go into all the research. <laughs> And who do we come across? But the father of flow research, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi did a lot of research in flow states. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit today about flow states and a little bit about that research. But mostly, I'm going to be bringing it back to practices for you in your life and why this matters as we evolve and grow and learn. So that's really what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to begin with a question for you. What do you love about being alive? What do you love about being alive? Take a minute, turn to somebody sitting near you, and just share a few things that you're going to get in touch with this morning about what you love about being alive. Let's start there. All right. So then my next question, <clears throat> go right back to your enjoyable conversation, is what, when was the last time you did something that you got completely absorbed in? Absolutely absorbed in, you lost a sense of time, you lost your sense of self. What activities do you do that you can lose yourself in? Just share that, and then we're going to come back. Okay, good. Had a chance to talk a little bit about what you love about being alive, and what you, what activities you get completely absorbed in. Okay, it's also very nice for me. I feel like I can settle a little bit when I hear all of your voices in the room. It doesn't feel quite so cold and impersonal to me. This is one of the things I really love about working with people in person is that I can feed a little bit of your energy. So thank you for allowing that and participating, even though some of you may not know anyone else in this room. So um, this morning, I got up and, uh, you know, I'm always, I'm always a little stressed on the morning when I need to speak because I wake up with a little bit more activation than usual, thinking, am I going to remember to say what I want to say? Have I memorized the right things? And I'll give you a little hint, I never memorize anything, so the answer is always no. <laughs> um, and so then I, I go downstairs, and I was really clever last night, because I thought I'm going to be stressed out in the morning, so I'm going to get my coffee maker ready, so I just have to press go, right? So I went downstairs, and I pressed go on my coffee maker, and then I went back to my office, and you know, went through my notes, and then I was like, okay, I'm dying for this cup of coffee, and I go downstairs, and I pour my coffee, and it's just brown water, but like really like translucent brown. And then I realized, oh yes, you have to put coffee grounds in the filter. <laughs> and I hadn't done that last night intentionally, thinking, you know, you want it to be fresh, so you'll put the coffee grounds in in the morning. And then I paused as I'm pouring this like brown water, thinking, this is not coffee. And I thought, this is an example of what flow is not. Okay, this is not flow. Flow is not when you go on autopilot 
and you just mindlessly go through rote actions thinking you're going to get a result. All the time when my daughter was, you know, really young, and I usually would drop her off at preschool and find myself halfway down to Minneapolis to work before I realized that my child was still in the back seat and never did get dropped off. And then I had to do a turnaround. These are examples of what flow is not. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about what flow is. Because flow states, when human beings enter into a flow state, it is a space of optimal growth, optimal learning, optimal insight, optimal evolution. It is when you are so... Um, characteristics, things that we experience when we're in a flow state. But um, you, you're going to find a lot about flow in peak performance, adventure athletes, um, you know, people who are really trying to hit some peak performance are looking for a flow state because this is when we do the most creative, innovative, um, and when we actually push through barriers of what we thought we were capable of before, and we can actually outperform ourselves. So a lot of people learn a lot about flow because um, lots of organizations are doing research about how to get people into these states in order to drive performance. I'm going to talk to you today about how we get into these states as a way of being and a way of being in relationship with yourself, with the people in your life, and also with transcendence as you understand it. It's really for me about how we live a sacred life in alignment with what we love and with what matters deeply to us. And so that's the, the approach that I'm going to take a little bit today. Okay. So there's a cycle with flow. Getting in and out of flow has a little bit of a cycle. And I'm going to use my daily addiction to the spelling bee. The New York Times has a spelling bee. I do it every morning. It is the very first thing that I do, and it is the last thing that I look at every night if I have a queen bee that day. Okay, that's a little bit about me. So, um, for those of you who don't know what a spelling bee is, they give you seven letters. One of them, the middle letter is in yellow, which means every word has to use the middle letter. And then there's a long list of words that you need to make from these random words. And you start adding them in, and they all get different points. And then there's this goal, right? You want to get every word, and it's very, very difficult. And then they also rank you as you go. Like, you start with, like, moving up, and then you're kind of solid. And then it's, like, nice. And then it's great. And then it's, like, amazing. And then you hit a genius level. And then if you get every single word, you're a queen bee. And I'm like, I am going to queen bee every day. I don't. I probably queen bee once a month. Okay. So I want to use this um, to talk a little bit about flow states. Because when you start doing a queen bee or a, a spelling bee, and you can apply this to whatever activity you want to get good at, any of them, it starts with a grapple and you start with your conscious mind. Oh, there's a lot of very obvious words. I know this one, this one, this one. You come up with your short list and then you get stumped. And then you're suddenly looking at these words and nothing else is jumping out at you. And you think, there can't possibly be any more words here. It's impossible. I've seen everything that you can possibly see. And then your conscious mind kicks in, and there's this struggle, and there's this grapple, and you feel like you've reached some limit in what you're capable of. Okay? Are you familiar with this? With anything like think about skiing or think about writing for those of you who are writers or think about whatever activity it is that you want to be good at. In order to get into a flow state, you've got to get into stage two, which is release. Okay? It is a period where you release 
the desire to force a solution. Okay, the conscious mind initially wants to use everything you know to top down all of your knowledge and want to force something. And many people get very stuck here, especially in relationships. When a relationship gets glitchy, they want to begin forcing. They start speaking more loudly. They start diagnosing. They start analyzing. They want to start judging and critiquing. They want to start forcing a solution. But if you want to move into a flow state, the wise thing to do is to release. That's when you turn off the phone and you put the spelling bee away. <laughs> okay? And you go, okay, on to other things. There is a quality of surrender where you allow your conscious mind to take a back seat and you begin to trust that there are other workings going on inside of you where some part of you is processing this problem on the back end. Okay? This also happens when you fall asleep, by the way. Often I'll write something in the evening and then when I fall asleep in the morning suddenly there's an answer, there's suddenly an organization that I couldn't see the night before. Something will emerge. So first there's the struggle and the grapple and you're using your conscious mind. And the moment you find yourself beginning to force, you take a step back and you release. You release control. And instead of going top down, you make yourself available for bottom up processing. Because we need both. Right? There's processing that goes from the mind down into the body, and then there's processing that comes from the body up into the mind, so we create space. You allow other wisdom to come up. And this, by the way, is one of my deepest recommendations for how humans on this planet need to learn to live. We're very good at top down. We've got to get a lot better at learning how to bottom up in a way that isn't acting out. When you allow the bottom up to come, this is when you actually begin entering into a flow state. And when you get into a flow state, you go back into this uh, activity. So let's take writing. I do a lot of writing. I'll sit down with some objective. This happens every week. I have a newsletter that goes out every week. And I'm like, OK. I ask my program assistant, what are we writing about this week? And it gives me an assignment, which I need, because if I have an assignment, then I'm people-pleasing, and that's easier for my motivation than if I'm just doing it for me. So I've learned to find somebody that I can people please to, because that's good for my motivation. So he says, this is what we're going to do this week. I'm like, okay, I'm going to make Justin happy. I'm going to write. <laughs> and so I start writing, and then I stroll out completely, right? And I have to let it go, and I'm like, oh, I'm agonizing about the writing process. I hate writing. Why do I do this to myself every, every week? And then the next morning, I wake up, and here is something that is arising in me. And when I go back to it, now when I enter into a flow state, I'm actually following. I'm not doing so much leading. Okay? Initially, I do some leading. I create a container. Leading is great. But there's a point where we've got to step out of the leading role and into the following role. And then we start watching what begins to emerge from within. There is a relationship with emergence. And one of the things that we want to get really good at is this ability to get deeply present. So this ability to be deeply, deeply present to ourselves, to data that comes from within, to our inner beings, to not only be so good at being externally focused and attuned to what's out there, but to also begin getting deeply attuned to what's in here. And in that state, you start writing, and all of a sudden, the words just start flowing. And all of a sudden, you start writing things that you didn't even know were in you. And all kinds of sentences just appear. All kinds of phrases are just there. And it's so delightful because you don't even feel like, I don't even feel like I'm writing this. At this point, it's as if I've gotten into some kind of a flow where something is moving through me. But it's not passive. It's not like I just sit there and stuff moves through me. It's a very, very active and relational process because it involves three key things. These are my three key things that I teach and speak about. This is my life's work. A way of being, a way of being that is present, receptive, active, kind, curious. You need an attitude of wonder. You need an attitude of curiosity. OK? 
okay? You've got to be willing to be surprised. Your way of being needs to seek out the unknown, the mysterious, the limitations of what my conscious mind thinks she knows. There's a sense of reverence, there's a sense of awe. And there's a sense of love. There is deep love and relationality in a state of flow. It's about what we care about. Flow feels good. It is intrinsically motivating. So you cultivate the way of being in relationship with yourself, others, and life. The second piece is a quality of listening. And flow follows focus. Okay? And listening, deep, sacred listening, is about paying attention to what deeply matters. It's about paying attention to what you care about. It's about letting your heart guide how you're listening, what you're listening to, where your attention is, what you're willing to let in. It's about listening non-defensively, trusting that you can take things and they won't harm you. That's something that a lot of people have these days, it seems. We tend to listen with a lot of blocks these days. That's what I, I've been noticing. I, I am speaking about myself, not you. So there's listening, there's a receptivity, there's a taking in. And then the third, key, the third little pillar is about expression. It's about getting very intentional about what you're wanting to create and influence in what you say. How are you using your words? How are you using your way of being? How are you using the airtime you have? What are you putting into the world? How, what are you expressing? What are you bringing more of into the world? And how intentional are we about that? How thoughtful are we about that? So when we're unconscious, we're not super thoughtful, right? You walk down into the kitchen and you press the button and then you get water that has no coffee in it. <laughs> Most of us are living on road autopilot. But when we begin to wake up and when we begin to get intentional and when we begin to really seek out flow states, we're cultivating a way of being, a way of listening, and a way of relating out loud in feedback loops with ourselves and others in the world. And when, the, when that is in alignment with your deepest sense of who you want to be in the world, your deepest sense of your potential and what your work is, however you, want, however you define that, that is one of the most satisfying, enjoyable, intrinsically motivating activities of life, in my opinion. And it is exhausting, and it takes presence, and it takes intentionality. And then we get to the fourth stage, so we get into the state of flow, where we are stretching and growing and contributing and finding out and being surprised, and we're generating something creative. It's co-creative, it's innovative. We begin seeing connections we didn't see before. It's so exciting. It's the best experience. Really. And then you get to this place and you're sort of halfway done with your newsletter article and you're like, I'm so tired, I can't do any more, I need a break. And then we have something um, that Kasia Urbaniak, a woman who teaches out in New York, calls post-expansion contraction. Post-expansion contraction. Which is that you've, you've moved into this place where you've expanded, you've stretched, you've received, you've been in this state of creativity, and your being has expanded. And you can tolerate that for so long, right? Because you're sort of like a little bit of balloon, and then you contract. And this is just a very predictable period of rest, where your being needs to be able to come back down into your little more embodied self, 
and take a nap and put away the writing and put away the spelling bee and put away all of the striving and struggling and attending and pushing and driving and forcing and listening. And we move into a place of deep rest. And I mention this stage because in this kind of culture, we often don't value that stage. I mean, so many of my clients, you know, when they tell me, I don't know what's wrong with me, I'm so tired. But I'm very often like, no. So perhaps if you're tired, maybe you need some rest. And even though that sounds incredibly obvious to us when we say that, most of us don't think that way. Most of us don't think, oh, I'm really tired, I'm mentally tired, I'm exhausted. What are ways of resting that are going to really rejuvenate me, that are going to represent really good self-care? And I'll tell you right now, looking at a screen is not actually resting. Even though looking at a screen is a very common way of zoning out, it's not the same as deep rest. So you may want to be thinking to yourselves, how do I actually deeply rest my spirit, my system, my psychological world, my emotional world, my mental world? And a little contrast, zoning out, resting, completely different things with different effects. Okay, one of them will resource you, one of them will be a form of escapism, which is also fine, it serves a different purpose, but they're just not the same. So let's talk a little bit about characteristics, things you can um, find out about yourself when you are in a state of flow. One characteristic of being in a state of flow is that you are in its deep concentration. It's an intense concentration in the task at hand, okay? The other one is that people often describe um, a letting go and an emptying of the self. So when you're really truly in a state of flow, you have this experience of not actually being there. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? Have you experienced this? I see a lot of nodding heads, right? So one of the things that is so delightful about being in a state of flow is the disidentification that happens. I'm going to read you a couple of quotes that just um, describe this so beautifully. So, um, <laughs> uh, Piero, and I cannot say his last name, but I can give it to any of you who want it, uh, describes both the identified self and the disidentified self. So here's the identified self, and I'm going to put my glasses on so I can actually see what I have here. Okay. When we are identified with our ego, with our personality, with our finite self, whatever language works best for you, a body state tends to become a tension. A feeling tends to become a hang-up. A desire tends to become a compulsive craving or an addiction. An opinion tends to become a prejudice, and a role tends to become a mask. And if we're living from tensions and hang-ups and addictions and cravings and prejudices and getting stuck and lost in your masks, then you need to make an appointment to come and see me. And if I don't have space, I can give you referrals, but then we have some work to do, right? This is not a way to live. When we're disidentified, when we're disidentified from our ego, from our personality, from our sense of self. This is what he writes, which I really enjoy. I have a body, but I am not my body. I have feelings, but I am not my feelings. I have desires, they move through me, but I am not my desires. I have a mind but I am not my mind. And in the process of disidentification, we have this multi-sensory experience where we're taking in data from our bodies, from our feelings, from our longings, from our desires, from our thoughts, from our knowledge, from our programming, our memories, our visions, our sense of possibility. When you're in flow, you are allowing data to come in from multiple channels. 
and it is moving through you and you're being actively creative with it. But your ego is not identified with it. But it's also not the same thing as being detached from an embodied experience and somewhere out in the ether. Okay? It's actually deeply, deeply present. Also, flow states are about stretching beyond what you're currently capable of. It's a form of pushing. It's a form of expanding, which is why we need to rest. And there's timelessness. When you're, when you're in a flow state, time does two really cool things. It slow down, slows down completely or stops. You don't, even, you don't even realize the time is passing. It's as if there is no time and you're just standing still in time. And at the same time, it completely speeds up. It's as if so much time passes and you don't even notice it. Time goes exceedingly quickly and exceedingly slowly all at the same time, which is really fun. You get into the deep now, you get into the state of sort of transcendence, it's delicious, I love it. Um, let me think what else. Oh, and here's the other thing. Flow states are deeply tied to intrinsic motivators. And many of you hear me talking about intrinsic motivation. I know many of you have heard me speak about that at length. But here's all I want to say about intrinsic motivation today. Intrinsic motivation is about honoring what you desire. It is about having the courage to long for something. And if you've had a lot of grief and loss in your life, or you've had a lot of hurt in your life, or you've had a lot of trauma in your life, you're going to have a little psychological immune system that wants to keep you out of touch with what you desire, especially if you've been disappointed. And it wants to protect you from your longings and your passions and your desires, because some part of you might tell you that it's not safe to want, or that it's not okay to want. And I want to invite you today, if that is a part of you, to work on surrendering that. Because if you want to really get into the flow of living, like into alignment with your deepest self, you need to know what you long for. You need to know what your heart deeply desires. You want to let what you want find you. And sometimes, as we become aware of what we long for and what our hearts desire, we have a period of grief that can come up first. Because sometimes we're invited to just feel into the pain of not having had that for so long. And it is a bittersweet, healing, beautiful pain that will wash through you and out of you. And it is necessary to bring your heart back alive. It is safe to trust your desires. It is safe to trust your longings. And sometimes we get so busy supporting the status quo and being good boys and good girls and getting everybody else's approval and conforming and being obedient and doing everything that we're supposed to do, which also is an adaptive part of living. So I'm not devaluing that. I'm just saying, don't let that be your entire life because it's not a full life. Open your hearts. Let yourself know what it is that you long for and then bring your attention your intentions back into alignment with what those things are. Okay, let me think. So five practices. Maybe five practices. Let me stop there for a moment. Does anybody have a question or a comment about just flow states and the characteristics of flow states? Yes? Is this like Samhain? I don't know what that is. That's, that's a Asian Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I find as I do a lot more learning, you find that at least what I've often found is that different traditions will have different words, all painting, or pointing, sorry, this thing is falling off, all pointing to um, the same universal truth. So we may have different words, different language um, pointers, and at this, but very often we're pointing to a very similar underlying truth with our language. So many different words can point to a similar state. And whatever language, and this is I often say to people, if I'm using some word that doesn't work for you, please just translate it into a word that you like more. The point is the meaning underneath the words. I don't get terribly hung up on the actual words. And so, did you say samhadi? Samhadi. Great. So, anyone interested in researching that? That sounds like a very fruitful, uh, very fruitful uh, area of focus. Relaxed alertness. You see this in a lot of meditative um, traditions as well. This idea of relaxed alertness, complete presence in the here and now. And there's freedom. Yes. Yes. Freedom to be exactly who you are. Yes. Yes. So how many, you know, like, do a little check with yourself. To what degree do you feel the freedom to be exactly who you are? When, where, how, with whom? When might you not feel the freedom to be exactly who you are? And then here's another question. Who are you? How would you answer that? What, how do you answer that question? What is this who I am? These are rhetorical. <laughs> These are rhetorical questions. But it's a very beautiful exploration in life. Yes? Uh, Mary Oliver has a poet has a great poem called Wild Beast. And there's a quote that I think about often that seems to resonate deeply with what you're speaking of. It says, You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees a hundred miles through the desert. You only have to let, you only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a beautiful poem. It's one of my favorites. So then I'm going to give you another quote, <laughs> just a, a, a mental exercise, something to just play with. You're not in charge of what you want. You actually don't get to decide what you want. What your inner being wants is separate from you. What you desire moves through you. You don't get to decide what you want. The thing that most people get to decide is whether they are in resistance to what they want or whether they give themselves permission to want what they want. But very often, what you want is not a conscious choice, and it's not something you decide. It's something you respond to. And if you really want to live in flow, if you want to be in alignment with yourself, one of the deep practices is allowing yourself to want what you want. And that is 25 years of psychotherapy right there. Just so you know. <laughs> because the amount of cultural conditioning that most people have internalized to be out of touch with what they want, to judge what they want, to be in resistance to what they want, to think that what they want is petty, to think that what they want is selfish, to think that what they want is grandiose. I mean, the amount of self-judgment tied up with the simple act of being in alignment with what you want is the whole body of work right there. So one thing to think about in your own lives is do you, where do you allow yourself to want what you want? And what desires are you in conflict with in yourself? What things keep coming up in you? Like I really want blah, 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 but I can't. Oh, but that's bad. And then back to the Mary Oliver poem. Don't be good. Be alive. Be alive. Good is a culturally conditioned idea. Or at least let me say this. Question and redefine how you understand the word good. 
Because unexamined, good means obedient. And I would invite you to stop being as obedient as some parts of you might want to be. That good may actually transcend obedience at times. And that brings me to this point, which is, <laughs> I'm, I'm not against obedience. But make sure that you're obedient to a value, to a principle, not a person. So if you're going to surrender to something, let it be something other than another human being. Let it be something more powerful than that, a principle you really believe in, a value you want to put into, a vision for the kind of world that you'd like to create. If you're going to be surrendering yourself to something, have it be something a little bit more high octane than another wounded, imperfect, glorious human on the planet. Just FYI, go to counsel. Okay, five practices as you get into a state of flow. These are five questions for you to take away with you. Number one, what do you love? What do you love? Flow, in my opinion, is a completely useless state if you're doing it to achieve peak performance, to drive a system, a domination system, that does tremendous damage on the planet. I see no point in getting into a state of flow to serve some rapacious system that is doing tremendous damage. If you're going to get into a state of flow and you want to use these ways of being and listening and speaking, first ask yourself, what do you love? And let your heart guide you. Most of us go with our minds and invite you to actually ground yourself in what your heart is guiding you towards. The second question, and this comes to one of the blocks to flow, who and what do you need to forgive? Forgiveness is about your own liberation. If you have unhealed trauma, unhealed relational wounds, they will be like stones in the river, big boulders in the river of flow. The water will still go, but it will go around them. And if you want more momentum in the current, there's forgiveness and healing work that often needs to be done in order to soften your being and to develop self-trust again. So you may want to find out where is there forgiveness needed. And forgiveness is not about letting other people off the hook, but that's not our topic today. Third question, what do you trust? When was the last time you deeply examined what do you trust? Make a list. Make a list of the things you don't trust. Begin examining where trust works in your life. Being in flow requires courage. We need courage when we are afraid. We are afraid when we don't trust something. Okay, so if you want to be in a state of flow, you want to start examining trust and fear and courage and how these things are working in your life. What truths do you need to make space for? Truth is an agent of transformation. Truth disrupts the status quo. Truth at the moment is one of the most resisted forces on the planet. We don't like truth. It messes with us. And we don't want anyone else telling us what is true. This is wise. Okay, we want to discover it. And there's a lot up in the collective right now around how do we know what's true, what is true, what isn't true, where are the illusions? I mean, I, when I was in college, I, I majored in Shakespearean studies. And, you know, the thing I used to love about Shakespeare was the recurring theme of appearance versus reality. I have been studying this in literature my whole life long. I love it, and now we're living it. What is appearance and what is reality? If you want to get into a state of flow, you're not in an illusion. You are grounded in something that is real. 
Get to know how that's working in your life. Truth is a very disruptive technology, by the way. And I'll tell you, the very small places where I see it is when I work with couples. And the couples very often collude with one another to not tell the truth about something because it will disrupt the status quo. And they don't want the change that it would bring. So they will walk all the way around on the subject for a long, long time. So think about all the places in your life. Where, what are you avoiding? What truth are you not yet willing to let in because it would fundamentally change something that will make you uncomfortable? And then just be like, okay, bring on the discomfort. I can do it. Whatever it is that's uncomfortable, if it's really brought in a truth, it will be healing pain. It will not be, it will not be wounding pain, even if it hurts. And then the very last question, that I'm going to leave you with today is what do you need to surrender? Because when we get into a state of flow, we are in a state of surrender and receptivity and trust, and we're being moved along a stream, a consciousness, a way of being. We are at one with something that is bigger than we are. And that does involve letting go of some things in order to be willing to be on that kind of a journey. And you may want to find out for yourself, what am I willing to surrender? What am I willing to let go of? And what is it that I need to accept? Because being in a state of flow is not in a state of resistance. It is about working with life as it is. It is about working with people as they are. It is about working with yourself as you are. I find tremendous freedom every day when I remind myself that you are a wounded, imperfect human being with lots of shadow aspects. You need intellectual humility. You don't always get it right. Sometimes you hurt people's feelings. It's okay. You can repair it. You can be in process. And when I allow myself to be a work in process, knowing that I have never arrived, I feel a tremendous amount of freedom and playfulness in that state. And that's what I wish for all of you. As you move forward, go and get into flow. Go and find what you love. Immerse yourself. Lose yourself. And enjoy. And thank you for letting me be here with you today. Yeah. Thank you. I forgot to say one thing, which is, when you get to the spelling bee at 11 o'clock at night, having not thought about it, you suddenly see 20 words you didn't see before. Yeah. And you don't know where on earth they came from, but there they are, and suddenly you see them. So, um, we grow like sunflowers toward the light. I'm going to read you a poem by John Hugh called The Longing. This is about allowing your desires to guide you. Blessed be the longing that brought you here and quickens your soul with wonder. May you have the courage to listen to the voice of desire that disturbs you when you have settled for something safe. May you have the wisdom to enter generously into your own unease to discover the new direction your longing wants you to take. May the forms of your belonging in love, creativity, and friendship be equal to the grandeur and the core of your soul. May the one you long for be you. May your dreams gradually reveal the destination of your desire. May a secret providence guide your thought and nurture your feeling. May your mind inhabit your life with the sureness with which your body inhabits the world. May your heart never be haunted by ghost structures of old damage. May you come to accept your longing as divine urgency. And may you know the urgency with which life longs for you. Thank you.